certainly has been enjoyable so far. So I uh, appreciate everyone talking and uh, trying to get some uh, information out of Punjabi. So, hold on, I'm sorry. Here's your pointer. Ah. Button right there. So I get this title, but really it's about how fun it is to be in Panama. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're a, a, a naturalist and you, you like animals and insects and plants, uh, the Neotropic is a great place, and especially because they're really friendly to, to tourists to go there. Um, and also because Panama has house one of the, the major tropical research institute, the Smithsonian Research Institute uh, for Tropical Biology. And, um, and, and so it's easy to get permit, it's easy to get access, and so we go there and we find what we need to find. Uh, so here is a fuel station, and I'll talk about this in, in a little bit more, uh, in the middle of the Panama Canal. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is actually part of the canal, which is a gigantic lake in the middle of Panama. And, and this is a great scene, you know, you're seeing water, you're seeing blue skies, it's nice and quiet, right? It's a tranquil scene. But that's not the sound of Panama. When you get on this island, I'll show you what it sounds like. Start about at 5 a.m. <laughs> Perfect alarm clock, per se. <laughs> so they're really common in Panama, uh, especially on this island. And there's actually a group of people who goes around counting them every year. We, <laughs> we think they should be spending their time looking at mushrooms, but you know, it's not as much fun as chasing monkeys. So the project that that we were starting. Uh, oh, I should mention that um, I did this work in my undergrad days uh, a few years back. And um, even though I'm not doing this work now, I still have a lot of attachment to it because it was really fun and uh, we found a, a lot of interesting stuff about it. So I'm gonna ask that everybody interrupt me and ask me questions as they come up because I think that's more interesting. I don't wanna be standing up here blabbering about my stuff and. Uh, and then wait to the end. So let's interact and uh, get some questions in. So. Oops. No, there it is. Okay. So this, the title, Beetle Belly Yeast, was conceived by my old advisor, Meredith Blackwell, at Louisiana State University. And um, this is a cutesy title. It works really well for NSF funding. <laughs> they, they like that, you know, something that the public can really get into. Um, so so the, the, the project was to look at beetles and then the yeast that live inside them. And the special things about these beetles is they live their whole life on mushrooms. That's all they eat. And if you can imagine, I'm, I'm, if you eat mushrooms all the time, 
nothing else, you're, you're gonna get a pretty bad stomach ache, I think. Uh, this group might disagree that that's not a bad thing to be eating mushrooms all the time. <laughs> but they're but seasonal, though, right? They, they eat different mushrooms, or only the ones. You know, that that's something that we don't know. That's that's part of the project that they, we were trying to figure out. Uh, we had some entomologists working with us, and uh, we were trying to determine the patterns of how these things work. But it seems like in Panama it's wet all the time, so you're gonna get mushrooms all the time, and there'll be beetles, and they might switch from host to host. But um, for example, this guy here, this is actually a, a, um, a Ganoderma specialist, so it feeds on Ganoderma all year round. And of course, Ganoderma doesn't go away, so it has its chance. So is this just the adult part of the land, or is this a larval thing? Uh, we focus on the adults. We tried some of the larvae, uh, which you see here. This is the adult, and this is these are the larvae. They, they have some yeast, but we haven't gotten a lot of good evidence for it. So the people who were involved, um, here's the PI. This is the big tree in the middle of the, the island, and everybody had to climb on it and, and swing. It's, it's part of the tradition. Um, this is um, one of my advisors who came from Korea and, and um, really helped us with this project, get it moving, get, it, get the work done, and you know, whipped me around. Uh, but I got a lot of work done that way, so it's great. Uh, this is our entomologist um, from Georgia State. So there's a big beetle on him. Entomologists like that kind of stuff. Find a big beetle, put it, put it on you, and take a photo. Right? Just like us, we, take, we find a big mushroom and we take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> so here are the big three yeast that you hear about. Right? Your Saccharomyces cerevisiae, something that is in almost everyday life for us, in alcohol, in bread, and people are trying to make it into, uh, to, to have the ability to make ethanol, it's not very good at it, uh, in terms of uh, industrial production, because it uses sugar, and that's it is an expensive resource. So people want to be able to use yeast that have abilities to break down plant tissue. That is the way to go, um, but we can't use this. This is a model yeast. It's one of those, those models that we use to study cell division. And then this is just a human pathogen. And those are the big three that we hear about, but here are a bunch of other ones that you don't ever hear about at all. But they're all there and they're really uh, useful in certain ways. So, okay. <laughs> it keeps going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, how many people have heard of th this figure? Yeah. Okay, so there's an estimated 1.5 million species of fungi. This is an old number. The latest estimate is up to 6 million. Yeah. So, there's a lot of it out there. You know, the mushroom world, we're just touching the iceberg of what's happening. But, in, so in yeast, there's a lot of potential to find new species. And when you find the right habitat, <coughs> you will find new species. So here's what yeast look like. Right? Um, round, less round, slightly long, slightly less long cells. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we've got to work with. <laughs> Sometimes it makes hyphae, which are the long, long chains. Uh, Sometimes these bunches, we call pseudo hyphae, and sometimes spores. But the morphology in yeast is, is really limited. So we rely on a lot of other characters, like what sort of sugar does this thing eat? Or um, can it ferment certain types of sugar? So is the one switchgrass I remember with George Bush too, who was big on switchgrass, huh? used to smile and say switchgrass, that was the, the solution. Was that a yeast solution? It, it could be a yeast solution, yeah. Right now what happens is you can take this witchgrass, you chop it all up, you allow the organisms, which is probably a yeast, to ferment that witchgrass and turn it into alcohol. Um, but it's not very effective right now. And so people have looked at more um, better and better yeast in order to do this. For the switchgrass, because I'm a George Bush fan. 
know, I've got a great hope for the switchgrass. So it's, it's, but it's really the yeast, it's not the switchgrass. Well, the, 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 switchgrass. the switchgrass is just the yeah. food. Yeah. The switchgrass is just the food. It's the yeast that, we, that does the, the work. So the project, right? Why, why look at yeast that live in the gut of beetles? Sounds fun, sounds interesting, but, but why? The reason is we think that these yeast will provide some sort of nutrition for the beetle because a lot of these yeast can make their own vitamins. We as humans and other animals can't make complete vitamins, but some of the yeast can, and they make all the vitamins. And so if they live inside the gut of these beetles, they could provide all the vitamins and maybe amino acids, maybe um, detoxification, you know, you eat poisonous mushrooms. Some of these beetles live on deadly dead cats and they're fine. So it could be the yeast could detoxify the toxins for them and then help them digest. So that's, that's what got us started. I'm new to the mushroom thing, so if the thing is poisonous to us, is dead cats, are they poisonous to like a deer or something? Not sure about right. deer, but certain animals right. they're not poisonous to. The, the, the toxins in um, the death cap circulates in the liver. So what happens is it circulates in your liver and you, your liver try to get rid of it because it knows that this is a toxin. But it accumulates and it keeps trying to get rid of it, but it can't. So the, the toxin gets concentrated and concentrated in your liver. Eventually, the toxin will basically kill the cells in the liver, and then you die. Uh, in certain animals where the liver, their livers don't cir circulate these toxins, they don't get killed. So, anyway, where was I? Ah. Taxonomy. So, basically this is what we've done for several hundred years. How do we classify yeast? We look at their colony uh, colors and texture, white, that kind of boring. They all like that. <laughs> Budding cells. So this is how yeast cells divide. There's one cell. It buds out. Make two. Two makes four, etc. And then you have spores. And then you have certain growth forms. Some responses to chemical. You see these strains respond differently to this chemical that I dropped on it. And then um, sugars that it can eat. And then uh, these tubes are for fermentation. It's just to see what kind of uh, if it can ferment the sugars. This is what I did as an undergrad. Each one of these two contain a single medium that's sterile. You have to do this sterilely. And I did this and I went through, I think that my estimate by the end was about 300,000 test tubes. But you need this. You need this data to, to classify your yeast. Otherwise, you're, it's useless. And, and that was the past. So here's what we do now. We actually add a portion of, of this and that's to sequence the yeast DNA. And that's really helped us a lot. So combine that with the morphology that, that I showed and then the, the physiological characters, uh, we do about 100 tests total to, to get an idea of what a yeast is or what species this yeast belongs to. So where, you may have this question, where do the yeast live, right? If they're in the beetle guts, where do they live? There's been just very minor few reports, and it looks like they live in these certain gut sections that are specialized, that have specialized cells to house the yeast. So probably a, a nice and strict symbiosis in some cases, and then some other cases not. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Is as that I get an analog on. to a small and large intestine? Or Yes, so um, let's see, it starts up here, you um, feed and then it goes to the, uh, the mid-gut and here are the malpigian tubules, they're equivalent to human kidneys, they detoxify um, the, the, the fluids inside of the gut of this, these insects and then it moves back to the hindgut which is sort of like our um, large and small intestines combined. So that's just to show you where they are. Um, so once, once we get the, the, the beetles, <coughs> we'll dissect them and then plate the gut material onto agar plates. But when you do this often, you get contamination. And, and I have to show this slide because it, 
it, it shows that even mites, and this is a, a mite contamination, mite can make maps. So this mite crawled around and drew a map of the U.S. <laughs> North America, yeah. Um, even the Appalachian Mountains, right? It's pretty good. This map, this, this mite knew its geography better than uh, most people. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are actually yeast cells that the mite tracked around. So you can see it's two feet, or more than two feet, doo -doo 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 -doo, and it made these tracks. So that's this yeast that was isolated from a beetle that's been tracked around by mite. And we always use this to show where we've sampled. Um, pretty much in, in a good part of the U.S., but I'm going to talk about here, where Panama is kind of <laughs> blurred out. <laughs> so here we are again. Uh, let's zoom in to Panama. OK, so these are the borders. And right in the middle of Panama is this gigantic freshwater lake. This is uh, Lake Gatun. And straight across Lake Gatun is the Panama Canal. That's where the canal was dug. And then I'm going to zoom in one more to Lake Gatun, here to Baro Carlado, I can never say this fast enough, Baro Carlado Island. And, and this, at one point, was the top of a mountain. But when they built the canal, they flooded this whole area, and it became a lake. And then this, this island, um, at the top of, of this mountain, became this island. So to get there, you start by flying into Panama City, take an, an, a taxi that takes you to some area around here, then you take a long boat ride through this narrow channel and then out here to the island. And here's part of it. It's one of the giant ships that we had to share the canal with. And this is how you know you're in the tropics, right? Lush vegetation, palms, just really nice. And then uh, we arrive at this, this field station. Uh, it's actually a really nice field station. You, you, you can actually visit it as, um, as uh, visitors. You don't have to do research to go there. So they have these big two buildings. These are the labs. Then you get the dining hall. Then these are the dormitory. And uh, we stayed in these and do our, our work here. So why come to Panama? I know why. Big bugs. Big bugs and lots of them. <coughs> but really, the bugs and the other organisms are just as interesting. Uh, These, uh, this is a frog that laid its eggs on a leaf. And then eventually, so these tadpoles <coughs> will break out, kind of squirm down this leaf, and drop into the water. And then you get lots of bats. There's lots of bat researcher there. Uh, I, I lucked out and caught this scene where this bat's about to snatch this nice snack. And here's this baby just hanging on. And then you have poison dart frogs. Very deadly things. And then this is a weird thing. They think that this is a intermediate form in evolutionary between worms and insects. And onychophora. Yeah, and what it does is it spits out a, a, a thin substance like spit and then onto its prey, its prey, and then that substance coagulates and traps its prey and then it crawls over and starts munching on it. <laughs> Pretty great, huh? <laughs> and then you have these great weaver birds. They make these nice nests. I think you can see them here. And then uh, dinner for some of the natives. Uh, an agouti. An agouti. Uh, it's a, a rodent, uh, fairly large, about the size of a large cat. And I hear it's good eating. <laughs> <laughs> Never tried it myself. Uh, <laughs> that you know of. Uh, that I know of, yeah. <laughs> they have this thing at the uh, dining station called fish stew. I wonder what that was about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the plants there are pretty spectacular, too. And, and because we have this amazing plant diversity, 
it can support a lot of the fungal diversity. So I can't skip over the plants. Um, things that are like sharks on a tree. Look at these shark teeth. They're actually large, about two inches wide. Imagine running into one of those. And then you have aeroids, some interesting other plants. Uh, nice pattern. This, this is another aeroid. Yeah. So this is these, this, this is the inflorescence of the aeroid, and then you have your fruits right in the middle. Aeroids are like calla lilies. Oh. Yeah. That, that looks like. Okay, so just uh, another pretty thing. Anyone strangler recognize this thing? Strangler yeah, yeah, strangler fig. So an innocent little seedling will germinate at the base of this tree, you know, twine itself up to try and get up to the, the sun. Eventually it will grow so big and so strong that it literally strangles this tree to death. And then by that point, the fig will actually have a strong enough trunk to support itself, or, or network of, of, of roots. And this is what it looks like after the tree has been decayed. So oh. this is where the tree once was, and now you know, there's just a big gigantic hole. I actually crawled into this hole and took a photo of it. This is, sorry, this is looking up. But, um, so I show you the animal, the plants. Let's go to the fungi. Yeah. That's, what we, that's what we want, right? Oh. This is uh, Marasmius hematocephalus. I found this right outside of the, of the dorm. And uh, I should have kept it, but I put it back. <laughs> I only found one of it. It's on this tiny twig. You can see my fingers here. Um, I am really bad at mushrooms. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> I know a few California <laughs> mushrooms, but when I go to the tropics, I'm blind. You know, I just I don't I don't know anything. Um, we had a, a, a collaborator who knew a little bit about what's growing there, but he never really gave us names on things. So if anybody here recognizes what's going on, um, please do yell it out to let everybody else. Well, now, you're, now you have Guzman's book, <laughs> Mushroom Planet. Ah. So how did you get this one? How did I get this one? Yeah, this name on the bottom. Uh, you know, sometimes it just come up somewhere. Yeah. Someone I did it. I put my photos online. Mm. So, so sometimes people will make a comment, oh, I think this is this. And then I, I put it into my, my photos. Mushroom this, this one's fairly common, I uh. think, throughout Central and South America. Brennan's talk okay. talked about it. Ah, okay, great. Uh, I put my photos on Flickr. So, some more, some more pretty things, Marasmioid type. Yeah, Marasmialis. yeah. And, and, you know, I put this in, and I think this is one of Dennis's glowies. Oh, yeah. Right? Doesn't it look like it? It does look like it. I, I only noticed that I had this um, after seeing several of Dennis's talk, even uh, including the one at NAMA this, this season. Um, and then when I was preparing this talk, I thought, wow, this is, this is probably one of those things. Uh, had I known back then, I would have taken this log back to the dorm. Yeah. <laughs> or come back at night. But you know, the, the trails there are really treacherous. Um, <laughs> really? Very slippery, it's because it rained all the time. Um, and then there are dangerous animals, which I will talk about in a bit. But people do go out at night to do their work. So those, those people have know, know their way. We, we, we were only there for um, two weeks, so we didn't really go too far uh, at night anyway. And then you get these, but these almost never had mushroom beetles on them. Hmm. Uh, for some reason, they didn't support the beetle. The beetles tend to like the fleshy mushrooms, and they like the crust. If you find crust, you are sure to find beetles. You get your nice puff balls. And then maybe more Rasmialis, maybe? Uh, yeah, it's different, like flat Fabulashi or something. Mm. Really yeah. But 
but I, uh, I it, it was fairly common in certain places. He's my favorite. That might be I Yeah. It, it was fabulous Brazilianses at uh, one point. I don't know what it is now. Uh, Avalachia Brazilianses. Okay. Yeah. So it has these, these nice patterns and we caught some little beetles that came out of it. And this is, I think, a common one. It's, it's, it was it, throughout Central America, I think. Um, polypores are really great places to look for, for beetles because they persist. Beetles crawl inside, and all you have to do is pull them apart, and you find tiny beetles. I hate finding those little beetles because they're hard to dissect. Um, let's this guy might be a good guy to take on the mushroom. You could go out there, he'd take all the worms, you'd take all the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, have, I, have I talked about how big some of these beetles are? No, okay. The biggest one is about three inches that I've dissected. The smallest one is about a millimeter or less. So uh, I try to get the gut out of those. Sometimes I get frustrated and just crush the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you just crush them up and plate the whole, the, you know, you add a little bit of water, you crush them up, and then you plate them. Often you find enough of those where you don't have to keep a voucher of beetle specimen. Now this is cool. Yeah. This is a bird's nest, but if you look carefully, you see these black strands. And in the tropics, we have these birds that collect fungal rhizomorphs and build them into their nests. Um, these are just ports of, of certain mushrooms. Um, and I will show that right now. Cool. So this was really a, a great find. I, I, I was walking and then I saw this big bloom, it's about 10 feet in, in the whole area. And um, you can't see the strands here, but the rhizomorphs are the black horsehair things that run down, and then you have mushrooms growing out of it. Tiny, how, tiny how large mushrooms. is this field that we're looking at? Uh, I would say no, no bigger than a foot mm -hmm. from top to bottom. Uh, yeah, here, here there's a uh, yeah. little bit better. But, uh, you can see the rhizomorphs here. That's a rhizomorphs too. There's something about the tropical uh, lactarius. And the lactarius would grow on the roots, but then they, they send rhizomorphs or something up the trunk mm -hmm. for the fruiting part of the fruit. So they get out of the damp air and then get into the air. Ah. It's actually mycorrhizal, but it has this thing. Roots are I think Terry Hinkle, did he talk to you, uh, you guys? He hasn't in a while. Okay, he, he was uh, showing photos of the, of the, the rhizomorph that just kind of crawl up into the trees. Uh, sorry, not rhizomorph, but the ectomycorrhizal roots mm -hmm. that crawl up into the trees. There, uh, a recent paper just came out about that too. Mm -hmm. So are, the, are those roots actually, like we think of roots that go looking for nutrients, or are those the opposite of roots where they're actually going out to spread themselves? Um, I say them? both. Yeah, uh, the rhizomorphs tend to be water conducting tissue or nutrient conducting tissue. They're thickened, and, and in this case, um, you have a, um, a thick outer wall. So I think that protects them. But uh, we find them in, in, in our, our mushrooms too, like rhizopogon. When you dig, uh, dig down, you find rhizopogon. You often find these threads, and those are rhizomorphs, but they're not well protected like these. But as you can see, it, it spreads itself out and then it made mushrooms along, along the way. And another polypod, I have no idea what it is. But wow. uh, it yielded a few beetles. And then stay horns. <laughs> a lot of beetles. You know, not beetles. No? Um, flies. Flies. Yeah. flies. Flies love these guys. Uh, and this one I find particularly interesting. It's like some of our red ones, but it has these spores that are inside this cage. And just as, just as smelly as ours. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't those big, uh, um, uh, you know, the flowers that um, produce odors? Those mostly have beetles that uh, do the flowers. Not one.
they they can have some sti some stink too, but um, yeah. Anyway, a cool marasmius. Um, this one is on the leaf, so you can see here is the mid vein of the leaf. It just grows right out of it. Yeah. I think in the tropics they call it, uh, there's a deflexula. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can see my fingers, so they're not very big. We didn't find beetles on these. And then uh, I have to throw in an ascomycete because it's nice. Uh, a coquina. Uh, either speciosa or soxapis something. Uh, and here, it's, it's growing on this very evil palm frond. You see these black bristles? What they do is they, if you, if you put your skin against the bristle and jab it into yourself, the needles will break, and then leaving you with a nice palm splinter. Oh. And it hurts. <laughs> By experience, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these cups are very cool. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the insects uh, and show you what, what the, some of the insect diversity that, that's out there. Uh, ants are, of course, very common. And here it is just actually stealing one of our fungus beetles. So we weren't happy about that. <laughs> and then you have wood wasp. Some of these guys actually do have um, symbionts inside their gut. And what they do is they have this really cool mechanism where they this is the outer sheath of the egg laying mechanism. Um, in the wasps that sting you, those are modified for stinging, but usually they're used for egg laying. Um, so here you have the outer sheath, and it, I don't know if you can make out this little line. Oh, yeah. That is actually the, the line where the egg will go through. It oh. uses that, this as, the, um, as a stabilizer to jab this little apparatus into the wood, where it will then lay eggs. And, and I was lucky enough to, to be at BCI, the, the, the station, where when the um, gliding ant guy was visiting. Uh, this was big news back in, uh, in about 2005, 2006. This guy discovered that when some of these ants, when they fall off the trees, they will spread their six legs. And then that changes the air current and glide back towards the trunk if they fall. So that was great, and he showed me what they looked like, and I found them in, in the woods. And they were. And then you get colonies of beetles, like these. Uh, unfortunately, these weren't on mushrooms or crusts or fungi, so we didn't, we didn't take any. Are those a millimeter, three millimeters? Uh, these are about ooh, five. They're pretty big. Diameter? Mm-hmm. And this is a scene where you, it's pretty common. You see, you see them all over, uh, just crawling around, making big colonies like this. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the many roaches they have. Um, I, would, I would love to have one right now, but can't. Good <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> just, just, just for curiosity, uh, because they are giants. They're, they're really big. One of this is, this is this, I think one of the largest species of roaches that's out there. Um, it just kind of flew out one day, and uh, I decided that I need a photo. Can anybody find a bug? Yeah. Wow. yeah. Looks like a leaf. Yeah. So this is um, one of the catedids or grasshoppers. You see it's outlined here, the legs, antennae, super well blended. It even has a midrib, can you believe that? <laughs> well, it's gotta hide that well, it's gotta be tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't try this one. <laughs> So, so some actual fungus beetles. And these are really pretty little beetles. Um, on this little log alone, like I said, they like kind of crusty things. You have, I think I counted three species at least. And one, two, little black ones, three. 
So this was a nice, a nice bit. Has anyone here known entomologists or have done some entomology? So in order to catch these beetles, we suck them up. So vacuum cleaner? Not a vacuum cleaner, but this apparatus here. So this is one of my co-fuel worker. Um, you have a tube that connects to a, um, a little vial. And then on the top of that, you also connect a hose. At the end of this hose, you put a little screen, otherwise the bug will fly into your lungs. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is you suck, and then the insect will go through and then settle here. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, if you suck in things that produce nasty smells, you get a lung full of smells. <laughs> <laughs> the hazards of being an entomologist. Uh, but this is how we collect the insects. You, you suck them up, and then you cap the vial. And this is what I did for two weeks. Uh, <laughs> uh, some larvae that also like to aggregate. And you see here they're feeding on a nice white patch of fungus. And that's me. <laughs> so the tropical beetles are really something else. They're really pretty, uh, a lot more colorful than what we have. Uh, not California, because California is basically dead uh, of, of beetle life. But uh, you go to somewhere where there's more moisture, like the east. If you've collected mushrooms in the east, you know that it's just full of buzzing insects. So next time you go to the east and, and, and collect, you will find them. So this is a nice one. Uh, another, another one of the pleasing fungus beetles. They spend their whole life on fung fungi. Uh, and these are big. These are about um, a quarter of an inch long. Some more of the little pretties. So do these fly? Can they fly? Oh yeah. General? Oh yeah. So you, you kind of sneak up on them a little bit. Um, they often just scurry. Mm -hmm. and, and try to hide, you know, underneath the mushrooms or, or elsewhere. So you, you do kind of have to sneak, them up, sneak up on them for a little bit. There's another group of, of beetles that fly really quickly. And um, they usually like to feed on agarics. So when you find an agaric, you come and <coughs> you cup your hand underneath around the spike. The be what the beetles do is they, they drop. As soon as they, they, they feel some sort of sensation that they're about to get attacked, they will just drop down to the ground. And that's how they escape. And of course the ground is full of litter and everything else, so um, they, they escape very easily. So you have to get into the mushroom right away to, to catch them. And then you get a handful of mushroom and beetles. Well, if you're good, then you <laughs> hopefully won't destroy the mushroom. Because we do, we do actually keep the vouchers. Uh, we keep the mushroom vouchers as well. So, some more pretty zigzaggies. Uh, but what the, the interesting thing you, you see here is another one that has three beetle species, one, two, three. Um, they are colonial, and, but in one patch, you will have more than one species uh, just eating. Oh, by the way, you can see here, these are the little larvae, little white grubby things. Oh. Here, too. I don't want to do a butler did it, but are we going to find the same fungi in uh, all of these guys? Um, so far, the pattern is not so clear. But I'll show you the, the, the data in just a bit. Oh, and then mites. Mm. Beetles get mites, too. Mm. Um, they, they tend to, these are phoretic mites, which means that they catch a ride on the beetle. Uh, so they'll crawl on here, you know, the beetles will move to the next space, and then they'll drop off and move on to the next beetle and make their living that way. And just another guy on the Ganoderma. Okay, so dangers in the forest, right? You, you're in the forest, and there's, there's, we, were, we were on an island, so we were promised that you get no real snakes that can kill you. So that's good. Um, but you have other things that, that, that manage to get over from the mainland. Like jaguars? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't find one of those. Uh, but what we found were lots of these. Oh, well, 
These are giant cane toads. Um, if you're from Australia, they are the bane because they've been introduced to Australia and destroyed the crops. But they are native to the Americas. And, uh, and you find them, they're pretty docile little animal, you know. At night they'll come out and you can actually walk and kick them without knowing because they just jump in the way. Uh, really common. And there's grad students there have nothing to do. So yearly they will have a cane. Like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, no, 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 but uh, you see these two big little big pouches on the either side? Those are poison glands. Mm -hmm. So nothing eats these guys. Uh, no, it's, a, it's a fairly common to uh, use that as a, uh, an intoxicant. Mm. Well, I, I was mentioning the grad student being bored. I didn't mi mean to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what they do do is you're supposed to catch your own frog and bring it to the frog derby or, or toad derby. As, uh, yeah. yeah, and it, it, they, they time it so that it happens around the same time as like, the Kentucky Derby um, to have a frog race, or a toad race. I didn't join in because I had lots of yeast to extract. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I did have to take a photo. Um, we will promise no snakes. I almost stepped on this one. Red touches black. You're OK, Jack. Red touches yellow. You're a dead fellow. This is a coral snake. Um, almost stepped on it. It just kind of scurry out of the way. Uh, and then what I was told is, oh, you didn't have to worry about them. Their mouths are too small to grab you. <laughs> so so man, this, this thing wasn't very big at all. It's about the size of my thumb in diameter. So uh, one of the dangers in the forest. And then tarantulas. I found one of these beauties. I didn't try to tease it onto my hand. I didn't know if this species was one of the more aggressive species or not. But uh, it was there. And... Uh, Got a few nice shots of it. <clears throat> and then army ants. We often encounter army ant raids. Have anybody heard about army ants or what they do? Army ants. Yeah. yeah. It's so easy. Yeah, they <laughs> almost killed Charles Heston. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these things come out by the tens of thousands. They're, it's a whole colony. And by the time they feel like they need to feed, they will spread themselves out on the forest floor and devour anything that moves. Um, when we see an army ant raid, we get out of the way. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to be in the middle of these guys because they can cover you and they have giant pinchers, which I will show in a little bit. That really hurts. So, um, Do you know from experience how it hurts? Oh, yeah. It, it draws blood. Oh. Yeah. What do they taste like? <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. So here's a colony that's at, at rest. So at night what they'll do is they'll clump together into a protective nest. And um, what my curious grad fella did was poke at it. Ooh, <laughs> And what it does was within five minutes, the whole trunk of this tree was red. It's just moving mass of red. I didn't have a picture of that, unfortunately. <laughs> but here's one that I caught. This is, so they have classes. They have um, soldier as the cast, and then they have the lesser ones that uh, don't, don't hurt as much. But th this is a soldier. You can see this gigantic man of war. And what it does is it bites. Oh. Luckily, this is just skin. <laughs> but but uh, I, 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 did, I did manage to get a few good bites from it. And you usually have to yell and curse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're really strong. And in order to pull them, pull the mandibles away from your, your hand, see how, how big the heads are? Yeah. This is full of muscle. So those muscles clamp the jaw. Um, is the thing just mechanical or also uh, Just mechanical. They don't sting. So, um, what was I going to say? 
<laughs> you could. Oh, yeah. Totally yeah. Perfect. So, yeah. oftentimes, because the, the, the clamp is so strong, in order to get them off, you, you end up pulling the head off. You will pull the ant, and then the head will stay on your finger, and then the rest of the body will come off. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> A beautiful wasp nest. Oh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't want to get closer for a, a photo, but I was really tempted because it, it was it was something. Sometimes you see, yeah, it, they're just beautiful, glossy, and they form this nice pattern. So, uh, what are we? Is that the ab? Oh, mostly the abdomen. So the heads are facing outward. Yeah. Yes, the heads are here. The black part is the thorax. Actually, not the head. The head is actually up here kind of hard to see, but you can see them here. The eyes. And then, shiny. Uh, I didn't want to test them. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have photos of bullet ants, but supposedly these inch long ants can sting a person and it's so painful that you will, will faint. Um, and there have been cases where some guys uh, have been stung and, and, and fainted and spent the night, night in the forest uh, knocked out. I uh, woke up the next morning and kind of slowly walked back. Uh, I, I think I spotted one of those, then I left those alone. And you got stinging caterpillars. Uh, it looks like it has feathers. It's really, really neat thing. Yep. And then scorpions. You don't want to get close to these. And then uh, a, sh a fierce looking creature, but Ooh. pretty shy. Wow. Yeah, uh, not, scorpion? not, not uh, yeah, I guess they can, you can call them whip scorpions. Um, does anybody recognize this in popular culture? I think it's, I think it's a vinegar run. No, this one is not. Uh, vinegar runes are only from uh, uh, Harry Arizona. Exactly. No, 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 there, no, there is such a thing. Is that down there? Yeah, and it, uh, they call it that because it squirts the scenic acid. Not this one. No. Uh, this is an amplipidid. If you if you think back in one of the Harry Potter movies, when the when the three uh, the students were trying to uh, were learning the the uh, the curses, right? So the professor used this thing and he says crucio, and this thing was screaming. Um, it doesn't scream. Uh, so the next time you 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 see this. Uh, part in Harry Potter again, you will recognize this creature. It's actually very shy, uh, super fast. I mean, I try to catch it and just, whoosh, and it's gone. Long legs, runs faster. Are we looking at the bottom? <laughs> so this is the top. This is the, top. This is the, the belly, the abdomen. So These are the two large pinchers that it's got. So it carries them over its head? Yeah, yeah, the head is actually kind of hidden here a little bit. So it's an arachnid? It's an arachnoid. I don't think the, uh, the arachnidologists would call it an arachnid. Okay, so that's enough fun. Let's, let's get to some serious work. Um, here we are back in the lab. The two entomologists will catalog the insects, and then um, me and my professor would be dissecting. And, and we go out. We start our day at 6 in the morning, go out in the forest, come back for lunch, catalog, dissect, plate, streak out the yeast, go to dinner, come back, streak out the yeast until midnight, and then repeat. I'd love to do it again. Yeah. It was so much fun. Um, so this is what they do. You know, they, they collect out the beetles, assign it a number, which matches to a mushroom, and then they pass it on to us. They keep half of the beetles for their vouchers, and then we get the other half for the exception. And some of these things are pretty. And then what you get are these yeast that I sticked out. And then that's it, that's, that's Panama. We're done with Panama. We go back home, and we extract the DNA of the yeast, and we do all those hundred physiological and, and morphological tests that I talked about earlier. But how do you know what to use as a nutrient in the, in the dish? 
Oh, it's just a, a general nutrient. So whatever you are, if you're alive, you can eat that stuff or whatever it's going to affect you with? Um, the yeast can. The yeast. Yeah, the yeast, yeast can. Generic it's a, it's yeast a medium. Food. I'm sorry? Generic yeast food? Exactly. Yeah, generic yeast food. And so we extract the DNA and we put the DNA into a database and then we analyze the data from there. And, and this is just to show what I've talked about earlier. We do DNA, morphology, and then some of the physiological tests. Did you find there was some that didn't have the I'm sure there were, but we didn't look for them. So again, morphology. And then this is what we've got after, um, this is actually a com combination of 10 years of work and I didn't participate in the first uh, six years of this work. So at the end, we got about 2,000 isolates from uh, 26 families of beetles and then about 12 families of other insects. We were looking at other insects too. And then, but when we were, when we started this project, there was about 700 and, uh, 750 or so uh, known species of yeast. Uh, by the end, uh, when I left in 2006, uh, we've added 300 new species mm. of yeast to that list. So we increased the knowledge by about 40%. The other insects you were testing, were you testing for yeast derived from fungi? Or other um, no, I was, I was actually, that was part of my undergrad uh, research was I, I did, um, I looked at other insects and then uh, wood, wood feeding insects. And that actually was, was important because we found some important xylos fermenting yeast, things that can break down the plant cell wall into ethanol. Um, so, just, just so a brief. Yeast, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeast, I mean, you know, I'm kind of like a beer guy, so I, it's always about <laughs> uh, the yeast breaking down sugar. Yeah. So, can they break down any type of uh, hydrocarbon? Is that, no. Does it necessarily need sugar, or could it be? Something, um, something more complex? That's, that's something the whole different. point of the 80 test that I was doing. Right. Is each test tube contains a different type of sugar. So then you test each strain of your yeast to see if it can actually use this sugar or it can use that sugar or not. So it's always common though it's going to be some kind of sugar? It's going to be, no? we typically use sugar because that's what yeast feed on. Um, and you know, sugars can be complex, right? You can have two or three molecules linked together or just one. Uh, so, so just to show you that this is the tree of the yeast, and then the red are the new species that we found, and they're not particularly in any area. They kind of disperse throughout the tree, but I want to point out two areas here where there's a high concentration of the red, the new species that we found in beetle gut. And, and I'm going to show you uh, two examples, two case studies of how looking in beetle guts, we've been able to expand certain clades, certain um, lineages of, of, of these <coughs> yeast that live in beetle guts. So the first one is in the Tenza Wayensis clay, Candida Tenza Wayensis. Candida is a common yeast um, genus. It's a horrible mess, but we won't go into that. Um, so when we first started this project, um, Mikase, a professor in Japan, described this from somewhere in between this time in 66 uh, 288, the timing is kind of uh, unknown there. But basically there was one member of this clade, and, and that's uh, Candida tenzawaensis from Mount Tenzawa in Japan. And, um, and then some years later in 2001, that, that's you know, a good chunk of time that's went by, where Professor, uh, not Professor, he's a research scientist at the USDA who um, who's a, 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 a well-known yeast taxonomist, described a number of other species in this clade here. Uh, are, in, are these all the beetle, beetle gut yeast? These are all beetle gut yeast, right? And then when we started, we found a bunch more. So it's just all in yellow, just to fill in this clade, to show that when you look in the right habitat, you will find a lot more than what's known. Were they not as friendly? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they, they were um, very supportive. Uh, it's not that we beat them, we weren't working on the same thing. 
it, it's just that they, they have provided initial evidence of what's going on and then we fill in the rest. Does, does the genus Candida only live in beetle guts? Is, is it already that specialized? The genus Candida is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's actually a, a taxonomic trash can where anything that you don't know where they go, you throw in Candida. <laughs> Sort of like our trichloromatacee back in the days. <laughs> right, okay, so, um, yes. And then this is the other clay, uh, same, same sort of story. So you had something that was described in the 60s, and then once again in the 90s, and then when we started, we found a bunch here. Uh, we named them actually, these are our names. Um, Candida panamensis, or Panama, and um, Lycopardine. This is, this is a fun one. Everybody knows Lycoperidon, right? Mm -hmm. There's a beetle that lives inside of, a per, uh, of Lycoperidon called Lycoperdina. Mm -hmm. Inside of that beetle, we have Candida Lycoperdine. <laughs> <laughs> um, a bunch of other names, uh, actually even this, you guys remember ATDI, the Great Smoky Mountain uh, project where people try to look at everything that's out there. Yeah, all taxonomy, biological inventory. Yes, thank you. Um, we found this species in the Smokies, so we call it ATBI or ATBI for that project, and, and people were excited about it for for a moment anyway. <laughs> So I'm just going to sum it up. Uh, that we have now changes in taxonomy, and uh, we use now DNA along with all these other characteristics that we used to use to get a more complete picture of what a species of yeast means. And then um, many of the species were found from an unsampled habitat, basically looking at beetle guts. Who would have thought of that, right? And then the novel yeast have great potential for industrial uses. I didn't really get too much into industrial uses because that's really for another talk, but um, you can ask me questions about it uh, in the end. So I'm gonna leave you with one question. What does one do with 300 new species of yeast? Anyone? Ferment. Ferment. <laughs> <laughs> self-sustaining they might be to be able to survive an environment like Mars. So I thought maybe you might weigh in on that a little bit. I think they're actually pretty wimpy, despite uh, the, the, the stresses that we put them through, high alcohol contents and high sugars. Um, they, they don't, they're not able to protect themselves as well as, say, bacterium, uh, a bacterium could. Mm. So, so in that sense, I don't think you're going to find yeast on Mars anytime soon. It sounds like yeah. yeast appeared on the, the scene of life a, a lot later. In terms it, of the yeah, yeah. yeah. they're ascomycetes, so they appeared about the same time as the ascomycetes appeared, mm -hmm. which is later than the other fungi. Mm -hmm. where, where were you getting your funding for some industrial companies? 
No, we were getting our funding from uh, the National Science Foundation. Hence the cutesy title, Beetle Bell Yeast. <laughs> were, they getting, were, they, were they passing it through from some industry that wanted to use the fermentation yeast for something? No, no. The National Science Foundation is the taxpayer's um, fund. So, so this had nothing to do with any company. So it's um, pure research? It, this is pure research, but it has an applied area. Mm. And, and um, the one of the yeast that we actually found, not in this beetle, but the one that I carry with me, this little guy here that I worked on for some years, um, live on wood. And we found a species called, that I, I called um, Spathaspora pasalidarum. This is a pasalid beetle. And that's now being used as the sort of getting for, toward the, the forefront of industrial uh, ethanol fermentation for plant uh, like bagasse. And, and switchgrass. 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 So, <laughs> so, so there is some, some uses there. And hopefully, if all goes well, in, in 20 years we'll be driving um, ethanol, we'll be using ethanol that, that came from uh, the research that we did mm -hmm. using public funds. <laughs> smells like <laughs> a mix between cantaloupes and bananas mm. so oh, you, can, yeah. you can certainly mix those in and, and get some interesting beers out of them yeah <laughs> let's get some huh. what are you working on now uh, huh. now I work on bacteria that live with fungi oh. so uh, I, I actually worked with um, leucopaxillus and, uh, and a few other things any other questions okay, okay uh, I want to thank uh, Tyler for uh, coming up with the idea to have a new speak for us. <laughs> because uh, Tyler's got a tough job. It's his first year doing it as program chair is find new speakers every year. And next year I know he's going to do a much better job because there's tons of speakers out there that will entertain us, right? Yep. <laughs> oh, it's hard sometimes yeah. finding speakers uh, for this group. Yeah. <laughs> but when he came up with this idea, I thought, yeast? Very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Extra copies of the Martina News if you're uh, one of